We've done that before and there's no point in doing it twice. So we rummaged about in this old Meccano set, at least that's what people said. I think I'd call it something different, it was me. And it can do it all without anybody having to get out and wave their arms about and do anything else. Now what we've got here is the Valentine. It's an ordinary Valentine tank and it mounts the scissors bridge. Now I won't, I won't go into details about the Valentine tank. We've done that before and there's no point in doing it twice. Except to say that this one, which is actually the pilot model of the whole series, is on the chassis of a Mark I Valentine. It's probably the only one left. And you can always tell it's a Mark I. It has the petrol AC engine in the back and only one hatch to open to get at it. But the thing that really matters is the scissors bridge. It's called a scissors bridge because it opens and shuts like a pair of scissors. At least that's what people said. I think I'd call it something different if it was me. But the secret of it is not so much the bridge, but the way it's opened. There's a device here which you can just about see when it's actually sticking out the back more than the front. It's a threaded rod that runs right through the mechanism of the bridge opening system. And this is quite interesting. With the um, original idea that was established at first at the experimental bridging establishment at Christchurch, they wanted hydraulics. And they found that hydraulics were very difficult to make in miniature. And as far as I know, the chap who invented the threaded rod the reason he invented it was he took, he took a model home and he wanted to finish this model off. And he couldn't make hydraulics in miniature, so he rummaged about in his old Meccano set and found a threaded rod and used that instead. When he got to work with the model and people saw the threaded rod and how accurate it was, they decided they'd use a large two-inch diameter one for the bridge layer as well. And that's how the thing worked. Now, what actually happens is the whole arrangement is all driven by this threaded rod. A, a power takeoff comes up through the turret ring to a gearbox in the framework above and the threaded rod runs through it. And when the tank's going and wants to lay a bridge, they start this thing up and the threaded rod starts to move. And as it does so, this whole bridge assembly comes forwards. These big rollers touch the ground first and the whole bridge still folded, is in front of the vehicle vertical. And from then on, the bridge starts to open out by cables, actually, attached to both ends of it. And the cables cause the bridge to open out and lay flat on the ground. Then you've got a bridge which is actually 34 feet long, designed to cover a gap of 30 feet. But at this point, the vehicle that can detach itself from the bridge and stand aside while the fighting vehicles make their way over the bridge. And then, if need be, the um, bridge layer can cross the bridge and can pick the bridge up from the opposite side. And it can do it all without anybody having to get out and wave their arms about and do anything else. Well, I say that, there's only two in there anyway. There's a driver who has the actual control of the bridge and there's the, um, the commander who tells him what to do standing. But they're the only two crew in these vehicles. They're, they're quite unique. The reason they folded the bridge in the first place because obviously a 30-foot bridge on a vehicle that's a lot shorter looks a bit ridiculous, a bit clumsy and was liable to clout things. They don't worry about that now because tanks have got bigger. But when they first thought of them, they decided to make the bridge fold in the middle and that's why it does so. It's a curious business at the best of times, but that's how it actually works. What you did was you took a tank complete with turrets you took the turret off and put the bridge layer assembly on. And most of this was done by the Southern Railway, as it was called in those days, based at their depot in Eastleigh in Hampshire, just north of Southampton. And that's where all the bridge layers were made. It is said that when the turrets of these vehicles were taken off, they each had a two-pounder turret on them, the turrets were then used on AEC armoured cars, which were just leaving the factory. So that's why they reused the, um, the turret a second time on another vehicle and didn't waste anything. Now these things were actually used quite considerably. They saw service in Northwest Europe, in Italy to some extent, and even as far afield as Burma. And they were quite efficient. 
The vehicle, the ordinary um, Valentine, will do about sort of 20, 15 to 20 miles an hour normally, and it could do that with the bridge on, and it could lay the bridge pretty well anywhere. The only country that didn't take them, except they took a sample one, was Australia. They used the Covenanter scissors bridge layer, of which they've got a few left to show people what they look like. But um, the Valentine was a reliable tank, and that was why it was chosen as the main sort of mounting for this uh, particular type of bridge. The bridge itself is mainly built of aluminium, and it's welded together. So it was quite strong, but it would only take a tank up to about 30, 35 tonnes. It could take a tank, it could take up to a Sherman, but mainly it was tanks lighter than that, like other Valentines that it could go across. And they could handle it quite well. They could take the weight without collapsing. But that's the Valentine bridge layer, and that's how it works. It's quite a unique vehicle. If you like our tank chats, don't forget to subscribe, press that little notification bell, and if you really do like us, try and support us on Patreon. Um, we can only do these films, or a charity, if you support us. So thank you if you're supporting us already. If you do like all this content, please do have a look at see if you might support us some more.